Firstly, I'd like to start by thanking MCB for hosting this event. I think just from uh, my time here already, I've really benefited from listening to the other speakers, mashallah. And uh, I think there's a lot we can take away from listening to our joint experiences, um, and just in terms of how the prevent agenda actually affects us collectively. Uh, I think uh, Brother Abdul Karim introduced me briefly uh, earlier, but I just to reintroduce myself. So my name is Ala Samarai. I'm the Vice President of Student Affairs of FOSIS. It's the Federation of Student Islamic Societies. As an organization, it's the national umbrella organization of Islamic societies across university and college campuses, uh, representing over 100,000 Muslim students. Uh, we aim to serve, represent their interests, and, and support them where, where possible. And uh, like many organizations here today, we've been quite heavily involved in the prevent debate, um, particularly with regards to the debate around uh, campuses being hotbeds of radicalization. Um, as Abdul Karim uh, earlier mentioned, we had been targeted specifically by Theresa May, the Home Secretary, um, which I'll touch upon later, inshallah. Um, so really, I'm here, I, I can't really call myself an expert, to be honest, but uh, I, I do think I can provide at least the Muslim student perspective with regards to how PREVENT has impacted Muslim students on a real level, uh, as the brother here was, was mentioning earlier, in terms of the, the on the level, on the ground, how it's actually impacting Muslim students. Um, so, as we already know, the risk of radicalization on university campuses has long been an area of interest for the government. Um, the new PREVENT agenda was pretty much indicative of this. It targeted universities yet again. Uh, just before the report was released, Theresa May made statements to say that universities were being complacent in tackling radicalization. In the same uh, statement, she then attacked my organization for not doing enough to tackle extremism. Um, and her particular words has been complacency around universities. I don't think they have been sufficiently willing to recognize what can be happening on their campuses and the radicalization that can take place. I think there's more that universities can do. Now, this demonstrates really that pre and post a new strategy that university is still a focal area with regards to implementing the prevent strategy. And even though there is no hard evidence to actually suggest that this is actually the case, that you know, in fact, there is extremism on campuses, there is a link. Uh, and this is in fact a view held by many vice chancellors across the UK, uh, as well as our own uh, university's minister, D David Willits. Uh, but really, like really importantly here today, I really want to just relay the, the impact that PREVENT has had on Muslim students. And by, by just pinpointing a few key areas, um, I want to start with probably the most, um, the most concerning, uh, and when that's still coming up quite prominently, uh, just recently in the media in fact, and that is of spying on Muslim students on our campuses. I'm not sure whether you've, you've heard recently in the news, there's been a story recently that The Guardian released, uh, which has been picked up on by other media outlets, um, with regards to university staff and student union officials uh, being approached by Prevent, being told to spy on students, uh, essentially spy on their Islamic societies, um, and inform them of vulnerable students um, when they see them. This has obviously caused a lot of tension uh, on university, at uni university level with, amongst student union officials and, and university staff. And, but it's been great to see the response coming from the ground in terms of being very much in support of Muslim students um, against these, this violation on their human rights. Um, but unfortunately, this is only one event of many that have previously occurred. Um, we pre in a couple of years back, we, we saw students at a Scotland University, Scottish University, uh, in Dundee, we had MI5, MI5 officers knocking on their doors, asking them questions like, do you know where Bin Laden is, um, and so on and so forth. And uh, qu quite a terrible incident that happened at UCL, for those of you who are aware. Um, there was, unfortunately, the, the Detroit bomb uh, incident where they, they found links between the uh, Abdul Farouk, Abdul Muttalib, Amar Farouk, Abdul Muttalib, to the University Islamic Society. Uh, following which um, MI5 requested that the university pass over contact details of Muslim students, these are innocent students who've had nothing to do with the incident at all, yet they had their rights taken away from them and their details passed over. Um, so this is, it just emphasizes really the severe repercussions that we can see on student and staff welfare um, when universities attempt to take matters of counter-terrorism into their own hands. And I've yet to see a positive influence of this. So, um, <laughs> and I think Rizwan here is a, is a good example. And I actually had this down, but he's here, so he's going to talk about this enough, I'm pretty sure. But it's, it's definitely just looking over at the University of Nottingham and the way it handled uh, the case with regards to Rizwan and uh, his colleague Hisham Yazza. 
um, really is indicative of the neg negative impact um, placing issues of security, such sensitive issues of security into the hands of universities who are in fact, as already mentioned, aren't actually accountable. Um, so that's one area, the surviving of students is quite a big issue, uh, unfortunately. Um, moving on from that, however, we have also a growing concern around freedom of expression. This has been quite a rife uh, debate on campuses, uh, hitting local level, national, we've got representatives from the NUS here who can probably attest to this as well. So on every different sphere we are, we're talking about freedom of expression. Uh, about do we bring in these hate speakers uh, and so on and so forth, what is defined as an extremist and so when we look at the new prevent strategy and the new definition of what an extremist actually is, and I'll just read this out, uh, it's someone who does not dis subscribe to human rights, equality before the law, democracy and full participation in society, including those who promote or implicitly tolerate the killing of British soldiers. Now you can have whatever opinions you have on, on this definition, um, but I personally feel it's a very shallow one which has many gaping holes and can be very problematic moving forward in terms of who isn't, who isn't an extremist, who, who, who else is going to be you know, vilified under this new definition. Um, unfortunately, we, we may well face, I mean, FOCUS was already targeted, my own organ organisation was already targeted for being complacent in our approach to ex you know, extremism on campus, and I feel this only will exacerbate these, this issue in terms of more innocent individuals being labelled as extremists, even though it's simply it's just, I guess, not subscribing to so-called British values. Uh, and finally, I'd like to just make this point about, uh, unfortunately, the impact this is happening psychologically on Muslim students. We've got Freshers Weeks now happening up and down the country. Islamic society is getting all the acts together, you know, having a range of events. But unfortunately, because of the increasing uh, fear and uh, hesit hesitance, basically, surrounding participation in, in institutions such as Islamic societies, where well, you keep hearing like, you know, students are being spied on, they're being arrested, you know, so on and so forth. Um, we have a, we've got now this generation of Muslim students coming in who are, are very reluctant to actually participate in, and get active on campus. And it's just such a humongous shame because really, I'm, I'm a student, I've, I'm going back into university now, uh, just, just next Monday, hopefully. And to think that somebody will be deprived of the opportunity to get involved in an institution such as the Islamic society. Islamic societies who have done amazing, tremendous work throughout the years, uh, from charity to interfaith to community outreach. Um, it's such a huge shame that because of this stigma attached around Islamic societies, we might see students you know, being hesitant about actually participating. I think that's a huge issue that our members are now facing, and uh, we're trying to support them in whatever way we can. Um, but it's something to really bear in mind in terms of the impact this, ha this is having on innocent students who uh, have done nothing wrong other than, you know, prescribe to a particular faith or look a particular way. Um, so really, in, in I suppose in conclusion, in, in the question that was put forward to, as the name of this event is, do, you know, where do we find ourselves following the new prevent strategy? And it's really, a hard, you know, it really saddens me to say I don't really see as it's not any better than it ever was. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Uh, it was still relatively new. Uh, we're seeing the effects of it now in terms of on campuses at the very least, never mind anywhere else. And, uh, and to think, as in within the agenda itself, there was 40 universities that were identified as those that may be of a particular risk, at a particular risk of radicalisation. We don't know which 40 universities these are yet, so we don't know what more might come up in the future. But I suspect that we may be hearing a lot more of incidents like such as I've already relayed earlier. And it really is saddening, like I already said, that innocent Muslim students uh, are being the targets of this, uh, you know, the stigmatization. Basically, Muslim students already uh, we're already a marginalized community as it is because of all the negative associated perceptions in the media and so on. And Muslim students are really no different in that sense. Yeah, but uh, but Alhamdulillah, um, from my own previous experiences with working with student unions, working with universities, we are seeing a shift in terms of attitudes, especially within the higher education sector, which is very comforting to see. So the impetus is now on us to actually make sure we're strengthening those links, making sure we're, we're getting the right narrative out, as it's not a small feat by any means, but talking to the relevant people and ensuring that they are there to support them with some students through these difficulties that are coming ahead. Um, and really, I'm, that's, I hope I've given a quick overview of the situation on the ground and welcome questions later as well, inshallah.